I had a student one year who wasn't my advisee, but he was a student I had in class, and he came, he came kind of shyly knocking on my door, and he's like, uh, Professor Brooks? like oh come on in what's going on you know it was someone I had had early in an earlier year and he was a sophomore now and no no he was a he was a freshman and then it was spring of freshman year and he's like I just have to ask you something and I said what he goes everyone's talking about registration he said what's registration and is that something I'm supposed to be doing (laughs) and so you know they're going to come in with a whole gamut of experiences, um, and I try to just take them where they are. I'm one of the faculty members who has agreed to take new incoming students who declare undecided as their major, and so a lot of those students, um, there are some of those students who get assigned to me, they maybe meet with me one time to register, and I don't really get to know them very well as people. I'm really lucky, I think, because my students who are my advisees I will have in class at least twice. I will often watch them student teach and then I watch them go off into their into their teaching jobs. So um, I really love that my students and I see each other more than twice a year during advising time. I have some students in our department who have a class or two from me who get to know me well and then who uh, ask if I'll be their advisor, and then they come to see me for personal things, professional. Um, so some, some advisees I see a lot and stay in touch with after they graduate, and others it's a once or twice a year, <laughs> uh, I guess, professional relationship. I see them as kind of both a mentor and a friend. Uh, I want to build some trust with them, so I, I don't think I really go out of my way to find them, but when I see them, I try to make sure I acknowledge them in the hall, and. I don't remember their name, I just simply ask them and just try to make a little visual connection so that they know I'm not just a checklist that they have to see twice a year, but I may actually be interested in their life a little bit. Yes, I'm working on making sure they get in the right classes to finish uh, um, their plan of study on time, but I'm also trying to get to know them as people to encourage them on in different areas of personal growth and help them really think through um, what their life might look like beyond Bethel. I hope that I'm able to help them kind of integrate what's going on in the rest of their lives, what's going on in their classes, Um, I hope that I'm a resource for them in terms of thinking about what they might want to do after Bethel, in terms of thinking about how they want to make their Bethel experience particularly um, personal for them and help them find ways to really get the most out of their experience here. If I get a progress report uh, about one of my advisees or if I receive information about an advisee that leads me to think that maybe things are not going okay, um, I uh, email the. I typically rely on email. I'll email the student a few times and encourage the student to talk to the professor and maybe to come to talk to me. Because I have many of them in class, I'm able to to kind of um, bug them a little bit. So if someone's not, if I know that someone's not doing well in another class, you know, I'll have them stay after my class and just say, Hey, what's going on in class A? Um, We need to talk about that. When can we get together? I try to get the student to come in and meet with me face to face so we can really kind of talk through what's going on in a class and um, and, and, and help the student navigate their options. Just kind of problem solve with them. Figure out, okay, why is this not going well? What can we do about it? Do you, you know, help them be aware of resources. Are you using the ask office? Are you using the library? Are you using the tech support? kind of depends on how well I know the student. Um, If I think that there's a reason to be significantly concerned, especially if it's a mental health issue or if academics are, you know, if if we're kind of reaching the point of no return uh, in a class, then I'll look to see what other classes that student is taking and I'll see maybe who else I should talk to. I might talk to somebody in student life. A lot of advising, I think, is using my expertise as someone who knows a lot about Bethel and what's available and helping students figure out then how they can use those resources to be successful. As soon as I get the information that says, here's when registration will be, I always communicate with my advisees. Um, I have a couple of sort of 
boilerplate emails that I send. I do kind of uh, keep check of who's responded or who has signed up. Uh, occasionally students don't, and those sometimes are post-secondary and they're not coming back. So um, I usually email them a couple times and just say, tell me you're not coming back. I am a huge fan of Google Calendar. I send out a link. Students can sign up for appointments with me. I bug them a little bit politely, but I catch them in the hallway. I see them. They're like, "Oh yeah, I got your email. I'm sorry." You know, when the inevitable emails come, "Hey, I'm supposed to meet with you." I just keep resending that same email, um, and that's useful because again, Google Calendar takes care of it all. I try to put the burden of their connection to come to me, but I'll take advantage of the opportunity if I see them and just kind of like, "Hey, we need to talk," and especially if I have. A a large crop of brand new first semester students, whether they're freshmen or just new to Bethel. I'll usually have a couple paragraphs just sort of explaining um, kind of how this works. Particularly when I'm working with new advisees, I try to meet with them actually prior to registration just so I can get to know a little bit about them. If it is the first time that they've met with me, I'll ask them to set to sign up for back-to-back -back appointments. Um, so we can do kind of a full four-year plan with them. I give them some uh, suggestions about what kind of preparation that they should do before they come to meet with me. I'm really specific in an email with a list of what I want them to bring to the meeting. I want them to bring a list of courses they think they want to take, uh, a four-year plan that's as detailed as they can make it at this point in time. If that student has has been at Bethel for a couple of semesters, then I expect that they will have looked at the schedule, they'll have a clear sense of what classes they want to take, that they will have written down a couple of questions that they might have um, if they want my advice about something. I would really like them to demonstrate that they've thought about the coursework they're going to take. And sometimes that's very successful. A number of students that are very focused and have a lot of vision for where they'd like to go will come very prepared and there's very little for me to offer. I tell them I want them to think about what they're planning on their summers um, in terms of jobs or internships and also I want them to be thinking about study abroad options. There will be some that will come in the first time I ever meet with them with a four-year plan. It will be color-coded. It will have contingency plans, it will be all, you know, and then I'll have some that come in basically with a shrug and that's what they've got. If they've done absolutely none of that, then uh, ideally, my, my, my preferred method is, is to then say, you know, I'm happy to meet with you, but you need to do the following kinds of things before we can talk. And I'll give them some suggestions and then say you need to sign up for a different appointment. Most of the time students have pondered but not have acted on it. Uh, and some are like, I don't know what to do. And so that requires a little more strategy and um, time. If they meet with me, you know, the day after they were supposed to have registered and I know that every minute um, classes might be more likely to be closed, then I might send somebody out in the hall for a while. Now, not every student is going to come to the meeting having done the things on the checklist, but even if half of them do, that really helps the process. If it's a brand new advisee, I don't really expect them to understand how the system works, so I'll just, I'll just say, uh, you know, bring a list of classes that you might possibly be interested in taking, any questions you have about registration or about different possible majors, um, write, that, write that down, kind of like you would if you're going to the doctor's office. I try not to dictate exactly what they should have. I try to um, give them a sense of, okay, you know, here's what we're going to do. If they have done beyond the baseline, that's great. But I know sometimes people get a little indignant, like I told them to come in with a plan, and they came in with nothing. I mean, I kind of, I kind of feel like it is my job, at least at first, to help them know how to develop a plan. My organization for them coming in is pretty much just uh, if I have something in their file that I need to look at, I try to look at that ahead of time. I don't preview their entire degree evaluation, but I do go over their degree evaluation when they're with me. So most of my preparation is done while they're there. But if there are red flags, like there's been a midterm progress report concept in the file, I do want to know that before they get there. Realistically, if I have five or six advisees who have all signed up in a row, um, I might not do all of this, but I typically will look up the student's record, remind myself of what classes the student's taking right now. Um, 
look to see uh, what kind of classes they transferred in, j- just so I have kind of a sense of where they're likely to be. I try to keep a record of each student uh, where I have a four-year plan, and then I pull up their degree audit and I track it against the four-year plan, especially if it's a student who hasn't declared a major yet. I kind of want to see how far along they are in their academic career, so I'll know how strongly I might want to encourage them to declare something, even if they, even if they end up changing their mind. Mainly it's just becoming familiar with the major, um, becoming familiar with what's offered when, and I've done it enough times um, so I can do that. If I were a brand new advisor, I think I'd want to take a good look at the four-year plan and kind of see how that plays out because a lot of it is just gaining some experience. I always say to the student as well to people who are learning how to be advisors that four-year plans aren't set in concrete, but it does help give you a guide of what the student's requirements are going to be and where they're likely to fit in. So prior to a student coming in, I usually look at that map and I make my own list of what I think they need to take in the coming semester, and then when they come in to meet with me, we see how well those two lists match up. Come in, sit down, I ask them to pull chair right up the desk, so we're going to look at the computer together. I usually assume I'm going to have to meet with new advisees longer than with others, and I'll show them how to look things up, how to look up their, um, how to look up their transcript, kind of how how the whole academic part of Blink works. I ask them how they're going, and if they say okay, but I've gotten a midterm for a course, and I say, well, I've got a midterm for this course, and look at their eyes like. You did see this, right? And sometimes I'm like, no, uh, but it's like, no, here it is. I asked them to come to that meeting prepared um, with the syllabus for the class and to talk about what um, is going on in the class, what's their take on, on where the struggle is coming in. I'm a little bit nosy. I'll come right out and say, well, what did you get in the last exam? And then I find they get a little more honest, like, well, yeah, oh well, no, I got to see. But that was better than the previous one, or I have talked to the instructor and um, sometimes I just, uh, you know, make the rubber meet the road and just say, this is the way it is. You've got to do better or I'm going to advise you drop. Every first time that I meet with someone, we put together a four-year plan, even if they're freshmen, even if they have no idea kind of what's next for them. I really try to put together something that gives them a, a little bit of an idea of where they might want to go next. Um, If they're thinking about studying abroad, showing them how that could fit in. I ask specifically about each of the classes they're taking. How do they like it? Are they being challenged by it? What's your greatest challenge? And then, okay, what are you thinking about for now, next semester? If they think they don't have time, for example, to do TCO or to do the choir or to, um, you know, have a job or whatever it might be, we kind of look and see, okay, is it really true that you don't have time to do this? Let's look and see how many credits you really have to take. And often we discover, oh, you do have time for that. Or, uh, you know, we'll say, you're going to have to prioritize. You want to do too much. And I think doing that four-year plan right at the beginning is really important. And that's something that I would recommend. I actually like to start by getting the student to talk about other things that aren't class-related. It takes a little bit of time. And that's why, particularly with new advisees, I try to have them come in for a meeting prior to registration, just so I have more time to do that. When I make a four-year plan, I also start with their senior year, because often those classes are a little bit more set in stone. You know, we only offer senior SEM or student teaching one semester out of the out of the year. So we I in my case I start with student teaching and then we work backwards from okay if you're going to student teach here then you have to take this course, this course, this course, this course. Um, so I find starting with the senior year is a little bit easier in terms of figuring out then how the other things need to to play out. I want to get to know more about the student. I want to know Um, a little bit more about who they are, what they're interested in, what they think they might like to do career-wise, what experiences they've had. Pencil and paper really is my friend. I end up doing a lot of sketching. We do a lot of arrow drawing. We do um, that kind of thing. I have a, I keep a folder for each advisee. Um, And because I don't have electronic copies of 
of what we end up sketching out, then as we leave my office, we go and make a Xerox copy. So the student has a copy of their schedule and I have a copy in their folder. Between the two of us, we try to hang on to that. I also want them to be able to feel comfortable with me so that they see me as another resource or, or person, a support person at Bethel to come and talk to about any number of things. My advisees who do end up in English or in especially different majors in the humanities, um, I want to rem- I want to f- <laughs> confirm for them that that can be a really good choice of a major or a minor, but that they also need to be particularly deliberate in thinking about what do they maybe want to do after graduation and how can they position themselves well. Occasionally there's students that don't want anything to do with the major at all. They see it as a good major, a good discipline, but their heart lies somewhere else, and that's either going to happen in grad school or they've pretty well got their mind made up about a occupation that they may not use the the content of the major but may use the skills of the major. I like to ask students the question, um, if you could imagine yourself in five years and ten years, where would you like to be? What would you like to be doing? And and as we're talking about that, you know, we talk about how uh, what's the magic wand version if everything worked out exactly like how you wanted it to be? What would be an okay version? I try to tease out where they're at, make recommendations. Have you considered this resource? Have you considered career services? Have you considered a Tri Beta event where alumni come in? And same position you were at four years ago, but this is where their decision went. Um, so trying to pepper opportunities and, and let them ask questions and, and try to be as honest as I can, uh, telling them what I hear I think they say without me telling them what to do. Most of my advisees go on to be English teachers, so one thing that I always say to them is, okay, how is your resume going to look different from all of the other people who are brand new teachers that have just graduated from college? For example, if they want to go into med school, it's kind of like, well, what are you doing to favor that your application rises above the rest? It isn't just a GPA anymore. You know, it's work experiences, it's interacting with um, countries of lesser economic health benefit. That gives me a good picture of, of what the students are anticipating, which then helps me think through, well, how do I really get them set up to uh, be ready to take those steps? What internships or study abroad experiences might be good? How might a minor support their course of study? Um, those kind of questions. What are you doing to demonstrate that... Um, the school wants to invest lots of money and time into you. So, you know, it's time to stop serving at McDonald's or even it's time to stop being a nanny, which may pay very well. And if you're really serious about your career, what are you doing now? In the English department, some of our majors require an internship. Even those that don't, I usually uh, encourage students to consider an internship. Here's how to go about finding those opportunities. I know some students, you know, they love to work at camp every summer, but they want to be, a, you know, an engineer. Well, that's awesome, but I think an advisor can speak into that a little bit and say, you know, maybe your last two summers of college you need to think about doing internships in a lab or internships in your field. Uh, even with first-year students, I'll, I'll broach that conversation, and I'll suggest um, different kinds of on-campus opportunities, writing for the Clarion, um, considering being a TA for a class, that you know the kinds of things that don't sound too threatening, that might be a, a way of building their resume, helping them explore things that they like. In other majors where the job path isn't quite so clear, I think you still have to have those conversations. Um, you still have to think about, okay, what are you going to do over the summer that's going to help you make contacts, get better, at whatever, whatever, whatever skills you have that you're trying to work toward. Part of it is academic as far as GPAs, and as, as harsh as that sometimes sounds, if they're thinking about going into some grad program, they have to have a GPA. It's just simply too competitive. And if not, have you thought about other things you might like to do this major? Well, I'm able to give examples of what other students have done. You know, you could combine a co-curricular activity with some extra classes, like you could do the student newspaper, and then um, take a couple extra journalism classes, and now you have kind of a selling point that you're able to do um, co-curricular coaching for the newspaper, for example, or if someone does a sport, I'll say, hey, you know, have you thought about, I know you love soccer, have you thought about maybe taking a couple of coaching classes? Or have you thought about in the summer, maybe doing some, getting some experience? When we meet second semester, um, 
talking about their fall registration, but then conversations about what are you doing this summer seem pretty natural. Um, and I know that it's mostly a matter of finding a job that'll pay as well as possible because they have to pay, uh, it costs a lot of money to be here. Um, but I'll usually suggest some ideas of uh, not necessarily paying things that a student might do. We start talking about that really soon. Um, and, and again, trying to think about, okay, how can you be strategic with your time and your opportunities um, over the summer? You know, if, if, they're, if they want to do TCO or some kind of ministry opportunity, okay, let's think about how that also contributes to your preparation as a teacher. Sometimes students have, you know, I want to in five years from now own an NBA team. Well, that's not going to happen. <laughs> so how do we walk back to more realistic goals and helping them really think realistically about how we get from point A to B to C to D uh, is a lot of the work of advising. I think we maybe get heard a little bit more as advisors compared to maybe parents or other folks um, because we've seen what's worked for other students. And I think that's a powerful story if we're able to tell that to our current students. Here's what so-and-so did or here's what a former student did and this is how it worked out for them. I definitely do not see advising as just um, a matter of making sure that a student sets foot in my office <laughs> or communicates with me before I then clear them to register. I, I think advising is definitely more than that. I think you can look at advising either as a chore or as an opportunity. And the more that I've done this, the more I've tried to treat it as an opportunity to really get to know students, to really listen to what's going on with them. I think it makes me a better teacher if I understand kind of what their life is like or what kinds of challenges they might be facing, um, it's, a, it's a great chance to dream a little bit with students and think about the future. I think uh, the longer I've been here, the more I've had a chance to get to know uh, some of the people in student life, some of the people in career and calling. And I think having a little bit of that information just in my head or at least knowing how to look up information that I don't know is really helpful. Don't be afraid to ask questions. Um, in my department, I started out by, I would be in the middle of an advising meeting and say, you know what, I'm going to uh, check in next door and ask uh, a colleague what they, you know, if they have an answer to this question. So don't be afraid to, to tell the student, I'm not sure, but we'll get that answer. Um, so don't be afraid to ask questions. Occasionally I have people come to me saying, I don't know how to find this. Well, I have done the same, especially as, as a newer faculty, just ask. It saves you so much time, and although we do learn a lot by stumbling, sometime in the world of academic advising, you don't necessarily have the time to find it all yourself. Ask someone to help you out. See advising as a benefit to your job. <laughs> it's hard. It doesn't feel like that in October and March when we're really in the thick of a semester, and then we have advising appointments on the same um, at the same time. Because I send out my little link to the calendar really early, I spread my advising appointments out over about three weeks. And so I don't end up with a day where I'm seeing 10 advisees right in a row. And that, I think, makes a difference too. It, it doesn't burn you out quite as much. When the rush comes at the end, a lot of people are already taken care of. And so that's something I think that helps me not see it as a chore, is that I'm able to spread those appointments out a little bit. Advising is one of those places where students can be encouraged to think about how the courses they're taking fit into the big picture of who they're becoming, what they think they want to do after they graduate. It is a gift and a chance that it's a way to get to know a, a smaller group of students better, and you really can have an impact on their life as an advisor, so it's actually something that you can look forward to.